Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40K's Grim History from Real. I'm Zekthar. And I'm Yuxin. And we are the chroniclers of all that was, and all that will be in the 41st millennium. We've seen the rise and fall of many empires, and this month we'll be discussing the stalwart first founding of the Imperial Fist. That's right, Zekthar. And this week we'll be talking about their Primarch, Rogel Tor. But before we get going, a word of caution. <clears throat> Really? Why is that? This one might go a little longer than usual. I mean, we will be talking about the Praetorian of Terra. Fair enough, brother. Perhaps we start where this dimwit showed up on Inwit. <laughs> you finished? <laughs> you don't know how long I've been waiting to say that. I've been waiting on that joke forever. But anyways, about Inwit. Now, like all Primarchs, Rogel Dorn was boot-kicked into space and had the unfortunate luck to crash on Inwit. Now, pardon my joke earlier, and in no way do I think Rogel Dorn is a dimwit. But those who choose to live on Inwit really are dimwits. Surely, brother, the world cannot be that bad. It could be worse than Fenris or Nocturne. <laughs> yeah. well, fair enough, but it really isn't a whole lot better. You see, Inwit was, and is, a world of death and cold. Its star is old and withered, bleeding the last of its heat as cold red light. Tidally locked against its dying star, perpetual darkness soaks one side of the planet, faded sunlight the other. Crevasse mazes, frozen mountain ranges, and plains of frost dunes cover the planet's dark side. This is the Splintered Land. The beast-stocked wilderness, which shapes the bodies and beliefs of the human population that clings to life there. Under the ice crust, thick seas flow in sluggish tides, and pale and sightless creatures swim the waters, hunting by vibration and the preternatural taste for blood. Far above this desolation, great and ancient space stations and orbital shipyards look down on the cold shrouded worlds through perpetual auroras, created in a lost past. These citadels of the void have looked down on Inwit since before any record or tales can recall. Whilst on the planet, the light side of Inwit offers little more comfort than the dark splintered lands, being a land of drift-crusted saline seas and sparse, bare rock under an unblinking gaze of the red sun. There is little of value on Inwit. Its seas are buried or lifeless, its mountains bare of riches, and its native species vicious. There is, however, one thing that this harsh world produces that led it to conquer a star cluster and endure an island empire of order in the Age of Strife. It's people. Though they are barbaric, they are far from unsophisticated. The warriors of Inwit are raised to endure and survive. The world that bears them teaches them to never relent and that the price of weakness is death for them and the rest of their kin. Death comes in many forms on Inwit. In the ice storms that can freeze and cover a man in seconds, at the claws of the predators that roam the splintered lands, and then a lapse in concentration that allows the cold to penetrate the warmth seals of the hold. These factors make a certain kind of people strong, grim, and dedicated to survival of a whole rather than the individual, which I find rather interesting, actually. Why is that? Well, from what we have done voxes on, which world does this seem to resemble the most? Well, Fenris, of course, the death world of the Space Wolves. <laughs> Quite right, brother. Yet the people of Fenris are drastically different. While both peoples are very nomadic, and those that live on Inwit, moving between the subterranean ice hives to trade in weapons, fuel, and technology, and those of Fenris, wherever they can stay before the land beneath them, betrays them, and they are forced to move. Conflict between the roaming Inwit clans is common, and young warriors learn how to defend against their clan's enemies as early as they learn how to endure the death touch of Inuit's merciless chill. They're incredibly quick learners and have an innate sense of an object's functional value. And most importantly, they have the strength and intelligence to conquer those who possess knowledge they do not. Ah, now I see what you're getting at. While it seems the Inuit people learn to band together and defend themselves, Fenrisians tend to be more aggressive in individual heroism is a more commonplace than gathering together in growing communities. Exactly. But why do you think such a major difference occurs? Personally, I think it has a lot to do with the planets. While you say Inwit sucks, 
and I wholeheartedly agree with you, brother. Mm -hmm. It most certainly does. It is labeled an ice planet. Fenris is a death world. Mm, good point. I think it is best put by quoting some folklore here. It is said that in the time of making, the Allfather casts the sphere of Fenris into the sea of stars, reckoning it to be no place fit for life. Fenris felt cold of the dark and ran back to the warmth of the wolf's eye. The heat of the eye proved too great, and Fenris fled into the outer dark once again. So it is each great year that Fenris races towards the sun in summer and flees again, plunging all into the cold embrace of winter. <laughs> well said. I believe that is from the telling of Hakon Yellow Eye. Spot on, good sir. Ah, yes. Thank you. There are many death worlds in the Imperium whose wildlife, native flora, or esoteric nature make them inimical to human life. Even in such baleful company. Fenris is amongst the very worst. It is a world of fire and ice, of wolves and dragons. It is one of the most inhospitable plants in the universe. Dominated by extremes of climate, Fenris is listed in the Apocrypha of Skeros as one of the three most deadly and turbulent worlds inhabited by humanity in the Milky Way galaxy. Fenris follows a highly eccentric elliptical orbit around its pale red K-class sun, called the Wolf's Eye, that takes approximately two Terran standard years to complete. This period of time is known as a Great Year to the people of Fenris. For much of each long local year, the world is remote from even this feeble star, and its surface remains incredibly cold. The ocean freezes over as Fenris draws away from its sun, and its farthest point, even the equatorial seas, are covered with ice. Toward the end of the Fenrisian Great Year, as the plant sweeps across its sun once more, the wolf's eye swells in the sky, and the brief spring warms the surface. During this period, the ice retreats to the world's poles, and the gargantuan dwellers of the deep waters emerge to enjoy the bounty of the sunspot krill a type of plankton, bladefish, and other short-lived aquatic fauna. As Fenris reaches the point at which it is closest to its sun, the passage of the planet so near the star produces tidal forces that break and twist the suboceanic crust, exposing Fenris's molten mantle to the frigid water. It is then that the time of fire and water, the season of fire, has arrived. With explosive violence, the world is torn asunder. Blazing islands rise from the steaming sea, spewing flame, with lava pouring down their slopes. Below the surface, the waters boil into steam that engulfs Fenris with its sulfurous fumes. Great tidal waves scour the coastline of Asaheim and the islands. Islands created in the upheavals of preceding years are cast into turmoil by the global transformation. Some endure, but many are broken apart or swallowed by the seas, engulfed in the churning waters and casting their unlucky inhabitants into the deeps. So, <laughs> sorry to stop you here, but... So what you're saying is the land is so unstable that unity amongst the tribes can't even be formed? Precisely. Well, you know, brother, that's that's actually pretty brilliant. I know. Uh, <clears throat> yes, well, back to Inwit. <laughs> the ice hives and clan disputes remained, and while their world birthed starships and ringed its orbits with weapon stations, its rulers kept to the old ways. The ways that had created their strength. The warlords and matriarchs who commanded armies amongst the stars still living lives a little easier than their vassals. So it was, and so it is now. It was as part of this burgeoning empire that Rogel Dorn grew to manhood, and then to rule its interstellar domains as emperor. Much of his earlier years remain unknown, or at least little talked about. It is, however, for certain that in the cold and darkness of Inwit, a boy named Rogel Dorn by his adoptive kin rose to lead the House of Dorn, also known as the Ice Cast, 
and then to rule of the Inwood Cluster. The patriarch of the clan that raised Dorn became an adoptive grandfather to him and taught him much of tactics, strategy, and diplomacy. Even after he discovered he was not blood-related to his grandfather, Dorn held his memory in high value. He kept a fur-edged robe that had belonged to the man and slept with it on his bed every night. Dorn's innate qualities married perfectly with those of Inwit, and he pushed their empire further than any other. Dorn led and trained his armies, and fashioned voidcraft the likes of which had never been seen before. Now, 40 standard years after his grandfather's death, the outlying imperial starships of the Great Crusade finally reached the ice hives of Inwit in 835.m30. When the true emperor was reunited with Rogel Dorn, he regained not only a lost son, but the strength of a star-spanning human society already forged into a tool of war. Dorn greeted the emperor at the helm of the enormous starship constructed during the Age of Technology called the Phalanx, that he had discovered abandoned within Inwit's region of space. At this time, Dorn was the seventh of the twenty primarchs who had been found by their father in the course of the crusade. Uh, pardon me, brother, but do you mind if I give detail to the phalanx? It's a pretty cool ship. You know what? I was hoping you would ask. Uh, very well. Uh, the mic is yours. Well, the phalanx is gigantic, the size of a small moon, and is said to shine like a star. During the Great Crusade, the awesome magnitude of this ship served as a symbol of the coming era of the Imperium. The capabilities of the flanks are substantial. Entire portions of the vessel are used to emulate different combat environments for training purposes. Her foredeck is so large that it can dock a dozen large cruisers and has developed its own ecosystem, complete with wow. unique species of animal life that have had their own evolutionary history aboard the ship. I wonder what rats turned into. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just thinking, you know, a large ship probably... I figure all large ships got rats, right? <laughs> Ever seen Rampage? Uh, <laughs> it was a rat. It point. was. It was a rat. It's not anymore. <laughs> I'm just kind of wondering anyways what that ecosystem would even look like. But uh, sorry. Go ahead. Carry on. <laughs> the interior of the phalanx incorporates stone corridors, archways, and cathedral elements. As of the very beginning of the Horus Heresy, the starship featured a gallery that displayed the battle honors of the Imperial Fists, which stretched for kilometers. Of course, the ship continues to house the chapter's honors and relics. Among the most prized are the remains of Rogel Dorn and the Battle Honor Roma. Uh, <clears throat> Pardon me, brother, but a real quick note here anyways on the uh, um, Auric Auxilia. Is that, is that how you pronounce it? I believe so. Okay. Uh, they're, uh, the, as you just mentioned anyways, they're the standing guard of the phalanx, but their ranks were formerly filled with the aspirants that failed the chapter's test to become space marines. But this was changed by Gregor de Son, and it was during the wake of the Great Rift's creation, and de Son actually increased the ranks by thousands of Cadians. People, uh, the Cadians, after they tried to escape Cadia. <laughs> Pretty much. So the people that are guarding the phalanx, most of them anyways, are Cadians now, which I actually find kind of interesting. But <clears throat> so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, carry on, sir. Well, it, it kind of makes sense that they would be drawn to it since they were basically one of the first aids to their home world. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. And quite frankly, anyways, if you, if you were going to have somebody anyways defend your place, if it's not a space marine, it might as well be a Cadian. I mean, how, do, how does the old saying go? Uh, Katia broke before her people did. Uh, yeah, like that. That, that's what who you want guarding your place. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, uh, carry on. What what else is interesting about this, this space station? There are various descriptions on the Hang general. On. <laughs> sorry, I just, I just thought about that. That's no moon. <laughs> it's a space station. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Except for this isn't really round. <laughs> no, but it's the size of a moon. <laughs> yeah. And light actually glints off it very much like a star. <laughs> I 
that snow moon. <laughs> Sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, man. There are various descriptions on the general shape and exterior character of the ship. These include a structure of towering forests of spires interlaced with flying buttresses, a structure that leads observers to believe phalanx might have been a planetoid or minor moon. It is also described as a ship that is many kilometers long, triangular, in cross-section with its upper surface bristling with weapons and sensorium domes. Two wings swept back from the hull, trailing directional veins like long gilded feathers. Every surface was clad in solid armor plating, and every angle was covered by more torpedo tubes and lance batteries than any Imperial battleship could muster. And with thousands of battle honors and campaign markings all over the beak like prow. A fine piece of machinery, yes? <laughs> yes, it's actually, for those anyways that will be watching this video on YouTube, it's it's pretty cool looking. It, for those that aren't though, ironically, uh, maybe you agree with me on this, Yuxin, but it reminds me a lot actually of a Black Star Fortress. Um, A little? I mean, it, it's more, it would be more like if the Imperium designed a Black Star Fortress. It's kind of got the same points and it's got the geographical figures to it that are very <laughs> similar. But, anyways, <laughs> it's not as pointy, though. It's, it's true. It is not as pointy. But, <clears throat> yes. Well, getting back to Dorn, <laughs> the Emperor welcomed Dorn, his long lost son and returned the phalanx to his care, transforming it into the mobile fortress that my brother just talked about. And he also gave him the 7th Space Marine Legion, which Dorn obviously took under his wing. Dorn himself was fiercely loyal to the Emperor from the first moment that they met on the bridge of the phalanx, and he never once sought any favor from his father, which is interesting. We'll get into that later. Dorn embodied the human quest for truth and could never tell a lie, even if it would have aided his cause. Because of this quality, Dorn's statue stands as one of the only four ever erected on the Krog, next to that of Rabute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines. Dorn commanded the 7th Legion and its expeditionary fleets with peerless devotion and military genius. Quick question. Yeah. Who are the other two statues? I actually don't know. I'm assuming, I'm just assuming, I haven't looked this up. Uh, I'm assuming one's probably Sanguinius, and then... The Emperor. <laughs> well, no, because it, it, it specifically says that it's... Well, no, it doesn't, actually. It's just a statue that's... Okay, they've got to have a statue of the Emperor floating around there somewhere. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so probably, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think maybe it was another Primarch, in which case maybe the lion just simply because all three of those guys were part of the um, Imperium Secondus. Uh, maybe. But as you know, anyways, Gilman really didn't get along with L. Johnson very well. But anyways, <clears throat> it was uh, it was said that Dorn possessed one of the finest military minds amongst the Primarchs, ordered and disciplined, but still inclined to flashes of zeal and inspiration. Okay, hold on. Don't they say that about pretty much every Primarch, though? Um, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think well, anybody's ever mentioned of them. I don't think anybody ever mentioned that, anyways, about Lehman Russ. <laughs> Although, ironically, yes, he. I mean, you you do have to understand as you, you do understand you in anyways. I mean, the Primarchs—they're all great military leaders. I don't think there's a single one that really isn't. There's just the concept, anyways, of ordered and discipline is different amongst all the planets. Yeah. I mean, like, for well, instance, Alpha. What? <laughs> well, no. Kurz. Kurz, Kurz definitely kept his people disciplined. They're just not, you know, a good, happy discipline. It was more of a burn and pillage sort of Viking thing, which is kind of ironic. But <laughs> <laughs> anyways, few integrations of the Primarch and Space Marine legions, though were as swift or as complete as that between Rogel Dorn and the Imperial Fists. The ideals of the Imperium and the purpose of the Great Crusade fitted with Dorn's outlook and drive, and the transhuman warriors of the Imperial Fists were exemplars, not only for everything that he had built in the Inwit Cluster, but everything he had dreamed of for its future. 
From the first moment Dorn met his gene sons, he demanded of them everything that he would ask of himself. It is said that when he met Legion Master Matthias and veteran contingents of the Imperial Fists, he said nothing, maintaining his silence even when they had knelt and pledged him fealty. Only when he had observed them in battle did he break his silence and speak to them directly. He said that they had much to do and more to learn. To Matthias, he gave a single word of thanks for his service and named him High Castellan of the Inwick Cluster. Such an honor was also a deep duty, for the next he gave was to raise 30 regiments of new Imperial Fists from the mortals of the Inwick system. Without waiting or looking back, Rogaldorn and his Jean sons then plunged back into the stars. His records of the achievements of the Imperium during the Great Crusade were innumerable, and indeed, the Warmaster Horus said that he esteemed Dorn and the Imperial Fists so highly that he reckoned that the Imperial Fists, noted masters of defense, were to hold a fortress against he and his Luna Wolves, noted masters of assault. The resulting conflict would spiral into a never-ending stalemate. Over the next 16 Terran decades, the Imperial Fists fought on the burning edge of the Great Crusade. Relentlessly, they pushed from war zone to war zone were honored by each of their brother legions, and rose high in the esteem of many. In their methods of war, the ways of Inwit and the echoes of the Seventh Legion's victories combined, they drove ever on, without pause or respite. Just as on Terra, they fortified and built to secure what they had conquered. But just as before, they did not linger to rule their conquests. While Castellan with a household of warriors might remain to maintain its defenses, they did not administer or draw up and enforce laws. For they were warriors of the Imperium, not its masters, and they existed to serve in war and die for its survival. What they did take from all the lands they conquered were recruits. That seems rather noble, yet foolish. <laughs> you know what? I would agree with you, if not for the thousands of administrators of Terra flooding in behind them. Ah, huh, well, you didn't mention that. In this way, he seems very much like Rubute Gilman, and his concept after the Horus Heresy, where the space reigns would be the stalwart defenders of mankind, yet did not rule them. You know, that's exactly right. So much so, I wonder if he borrowed some of these concepts from Dorn himself. Uh, anyway. Shh, shh. You can't say that. That's heresy. <laughs> now, now. <clears throat> Anyways. Facebook says it's bad. Yes, yes. A famous example of this would be the Imperial Compliance Action of Necromunda, where the Imperial Fists won a major victory against the Orcs on the ash wastes of the Hive world. The Hive Lords consented to recruits being drawn from their population in gratitude. A fortress chapel was duly consecrated by the Imperial Fists, where they're as esteemed guests, but not masters. Rogaldorn asked no special rights on the world where the Imperial Fists recruited. Some Primarchs, such as the increasingly mercurial Perturbo, took every opportunity to garrison a world for their legions and claim its tithes. Dorn is famously recorded as saying, I want recruits, not vassals, and was always satisfied to keep his legion as a military unit with none of the civil or political responsibilities that came with governing a legion homeworld. During the Great Crusade, the Imperial Fist acted as the strategic reserve of the Emperor's forces due to their ability to rapidly deploy to the battlefields aboard the Phalanx. They made use of the detail of the planning and as such were soon found to be supreme urban fighters and siege specialists. After several campaigns and thousands of conquered worlds being brought into the Imperium, the Emperor returned to Terra to build a capital from which he could run his new empire. He took the Imperial Fist with him set them up as his Praetorians, and charged Dorne with the construction of the Imperial Palace, something that did not go unnoticed by the other Primarchs. <clears throat> now, before we get into the relationship with him and his brothers, let's look back on his harsh upbringing and discuss what kind of man it forged. Shall we, brother? Uh, sure. I, I can see why some people would find him off putting. Well, why? Well, first of all, for example, his attitude towards his own legion at first, he really didn't have much of a um, commodity, it doesn't seem like, per se, from this description so far. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out here on, on a little bit of a ledge. <laughs> all right. We're going to go to uh, 
Terran 42. This, you know me, I love sports analogies. So a few years back for the sports team, the Seattle Seahawks, they had okay. this great defensive unit called the Legion of Boom, right? Right. And if you talk to any one of those guys that was part of the secondary that was great, I mean, they were a, probably one of the best defenses units ever. And you go back and you talk to any of them anyways, and they say, who is in charge of this whole thing? They would say, well, it's Cam Chancellor. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing is, is that Cam Chancellor, he wasn't, he, he was one of the two safeties. He wasn't the greatest safety there anyways, but he had this leadership aspect to him. Now, one of the things that I find interesting about this and what relates to Dorn is, is that Cam Chancellor wasn't somebody that really talked a lot. He wasn't, he, he wasn't like Richard Sherman who, <laughs> what if you gave him the time of day, he would tell you anyways, how the sun rose. I mean, <laughs> the next 40 minutes he wasn't crazy like uh their, their their other safety crap what's his name earl thomas he had this he had a very centering concept about him and they all worked around chancellor the so to me anyways was that the enforcer yeah <laughs> and he hit i mean don't get me wrong he was a very good player too he was a strong safety and just for those anyways who want to look at like a good play of his anyways when he when he hit tight end Vernon Davis, they threw a flag on it and they showed in slow motion. It was the perfect hit, but he hit the guy so viciously that the ref was just like in real time. like, that, that's got to be a penalty <laughs> and threw a flag. But anyways, getting back to what I was saying anyways, Rogel Dorn to me anyways kind of has that same leadership concept. He's not going to say a whole lot, but when he does talk anyways, his, his, his soldiers listen. And well, it better because he didn't talk to him for a long time. <laughs> well, I, I, what I'm trying to get at here anyways, is, is that Dorn had this way about him anyways, that his, his, his troops would probably would follow him into the pits of hell. If he asked them to, I mean, they, there was, there was this certain leadership that he had very much like I was, like I was saying anyways, Cam Chancellor, sometimes anyways, leadership doesn't require a whole lot of speaking. Moderate. Or camaraderie, either. I mean, as opposed to, like, for instance, if we take another great leader from 40K, Horace. Horace was a great leader, but he was pretty chummy with you know, his 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 troops. Dor Dorn wasn't. <laughs> or like Russ, who was very... Russ was also, yes. He was very... Uh, he Russ was a proud papa bear. <laughs> I mean, or wolf, I should say. <laughs> you know. Dorn, on the other hand, anyways, I mean the way that he ran things was, is drastically different. And I think that has to do a lot with his character too. I mean, he's very stoic. He, he reminds me actually a lot of um, one of his soldiers, Alexis Pollux, very stoic, very stalwart. The one thing he's missing that Alexis had was humility. <laughs> In my opinion, Dorn has always been a very, is kind of a very prideful character. Uh, and one of the reasons why is just quite simply is, is we've just noticed and uh, we just mentioned the, the the thousands of victories. He doesn't lose. It's hard right. to have humility when you don't lose. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and he doesn't ev eventually, by the way, just to get a little bit ahead of ourselves anyways, he does eventually lose a couple of times in, in really big ways. And it really drastically does change his character into someone anyways that I think anyways would have been a great, like for instance, ruler of the Imperium. But at this moment in time, anyways, he is kind of, he's a little full of himself, a little full of himself, but very quiet, very, does have a very commanding presence and very stoic, very much. And very much like we said before, anyways, he cannot tell a lie. So very much if he thinks something is right, he will speak his piece about it. If he speaks if he speaks, but normally anyways, that, that, that tends to be a little bit of a problem when he's talking with his brothers who are also all very great tacticians, like we said. And, and sometimes that tends to ruffle a few feathers. Like for one particular individual, I think you're going to talk, you should be talking about here. And that would be a, a Mr. Perturabo or Perty for short. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he had more of it. It seems like he had more of an indifference to Pertrabo in comparison to Pertrabo, definitely not liking him, period. And not really hiding it at all. 
So, so real quick, we, we, we've probably covered this relationship more than any of the other brothers relationships because well, we have talked about the Imperial fists and we've talked about, and, and I have at least anyways in short boxes. And we also did the iron warriors. So yeah. we had more of Perturabo's aspect of this. And one of the reasons why <laughs> I think honestly, they didn't really like each other is because they were so close in the way that they thought of things. Oh, I mean, there's similarities. They had so many more similarities than the rest of their brothers. Both were brilliant yeah. siege engineers. Both were great at fortress building. Both under both used per, very similar tactics. Although I will say Perturabo was a little bit more um, brutal in his tactics. He was very much more fist punching through, ironically, even though his guys are called the Iron Warriors, as opposed to Rogel Dorn, who sometimes liked to use subterfuge if he needed to. Mm. But it's kind of like how do how do the pe people put is like Dorn was first in defense, second in siege, whereas in Petro was first in siege, second in defense. Right. The way that I see it. Which is horrible. <laughs> well, I think one of the other huge differences between the two is is like we mentioned before, Rogel Dorn never really sought the Emperor's favor. Now, ironically. He never really needed to because the emperor yeah. always liked him <laughs> as opposed to Rabo <laughs> always was kind of wanting that attention and he never got it. Right. Because again, the emperor never the emperor almost treats per Rabo like the second fiddle to Dorn. Right. <laughs> so I can see why I kind of wore on per Rabo, but I can also see, like he said, anyways, the indifference from Rogel Dorn. He's well, not dealing with any of this, so he's just kind of like, oh, I don't really understand why he hates me, but, well, I mean, I don't really like him either. He's kind of a grouch. <laughs> yeah. But, okay, so before we move on to the rest of his brothers, though, do you think there was any way, any ways that Dorn could have actually fixed this relationship? With his personality? No. Because <laughs> he'd have to give up something, which he wouldn't do. Or say something that he, he may not necessarily think. It's true. So <laughs> I think what really kind of puts it into perspective, I agree with you, by the way, if, if he, if he went out of character and did something anyways, yeah, I could see, I, I agree with you anyways. I, I think, I think he could fix it, but Rogel Dorn at this time and in, in, in place and the way that he thinks and does things. No. <laughs> well, like for example, the fact that he literally said that for trouble won't be able to break the, and so, no matter what, no matter what, yeah, <laughs> to, to Fulgrim of all people, he said it to Fulgrim too. It was like the worst person to say it to. I mean, he's he's the he's the rumor mill, I mean, <laughs> but uh, which is ironic because you'd think the rumor mill would be Lorgar, but <laughs> well, nobody liked Lorgar, so that's why he wasn't a very good rumor mill. <laughs> to put it to kind of clarify, anyways, just kind of how frustrating anyways it would be to be in a relationship with uh, like as a brother anyways to Rogel Dorn. So there were, there was at one point anyways in the great crusade where they're all, they're all doing their thing anyways. And, and Perturabo ends up building a fortress on this world and he builds it and it's, it's fantastic, right? It's because Purdy's pretty good at this and Rogel Dorn shows up anyways. He's he's on his way somewhere else anyways in the Great Crusade. And, and Perturabo kind of wants to, you know, he wants to show off because it's Perturabo. He's like, hey, check it out. Look what I did. Isn't this awesome? And Dorn looks at it for about five or a couple minutes as Perturabo is rambling on about how great his, his fortress is. And then he says like one thing. And he goes, well, what about that? If they break through there anyways, the fortress is doomed. And then he just leaves. You know how frustrating that is? It's frustrating for Perturabo for a couple of reasons. First off, anyways, he, he he just wants, all he wants is Dorn to go, yeah, that's a really good fortress. Or that's, that's, that's a great fortress. That's all he wants him to say. But nope, all he does is he nitpicks the one thing. And the sad part about it is he's right. That's the well, worst that part. And the fact that he just walks away instead of going, you know. But the rest of it's great. Or, you know, something like that. It's just, oh, I see the one fault there. Oh, you got to work on that. And then just leaves. 
and, and doesn't say that that's the only fault. He just yeah. says there's that problem there, and then leaves. It just leaves. Yeah, just the. the so not of- only is he going, ah, oh, he's right. It also goes with, okay, is there anything else that I missed? And this is going to infuriate him because he's like, okay, where else could I have missed? Well, there's no way, so anyways, at that everything. point, the Perturabo would be like, you know what? You're right. Go ahead and tell me all the other faults on my great fortress. I mean, who would do that? <laughs> but I can I can see how that these two, anyways, really. I could see how why Perturabo, anyways, didn't like Rogel Dorn. <laughs> That's really, I guess, what it boils down to. And I could see how eventually Rogel Dorn would just get tired of Perturabo. But. Per Rabo also had problems because because of like we mentioned anyways, just kind of his 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 persona and his his charisma anyways. His other brothers also kind of had problems with him. I mean, like I said, he's not the most charismatic of all the brothers. And while he obviously didn't get along with Per Rabo, his relationship with his other brothers could be strained as well. Especially, I could just mention if he thought he was right. Now, while most of these disagreements were smoothed over by calmer heads, such as the Astrani campaign, where he nearly came to blows with his hot-tempered brother, Ferris Manis. Really? I don't remember this one. Care to delve into it a little bit? Well, the war began after the Imperium made contact with the advanced human civilization known as the Astrani Machine Empire. Initially, only a single expeditionary fleet was dispatched to deal with the Astrani. But their scouting fleets were devastated by an ambush in which only Imperial Fist Captain Sigismund was the survivor. Subsequently, three Primarchs, Ferris Manus, Rugal Dorn, and Horus Lubricol, were summoned for a larger invasion, this time backed by the Mechanicum, which had labeled the Astrani heretics, who must be annihilated at all costs. This objective created tension between Dorn and Ferris, the former of which wished for simple compliance, while the latter pursued the same genocidal goals as the Mechanicum. Ah, the Mechanicum. Uh, So logical. Anyways, Horace attempted to intervene in the dispute. Coming to agree with compliance was the best option after hearing testimony from Sigismund, who had been witness to the Astrani ambush. Ferris only agreed to cooperate with his brothers for the time being, with no guarantee of anything once the fighting was over. Now, once the campaign was over, it was decided that a dispute between Rogel and Ferris would be settled in a duel between their champions. Sigismund would battle the Iron Hand Centurion Thos. After a difficult battle, Sigismund defeated Thos, but the warrior refused to yield. Ferris Manus then arrived and asked Sigismund if he was willing to kill a fellow with Stardings, which the Templar Brethren Captain stated he would not do so over something as petty as an honor duel. Ferris eventually agreed and ordered Thos to yield. Interesting. I, I know. And quite frankly, I actually found uh, a detailed duel of this by uh, um, John French in his scribing of, if I recall right, it's called The Eternal Crusader. And it's all about Sigismund. And I kind of wanted to plug it in here, but I did figure we didn't have enough time. And we are going to, in the upcoming weeks, when we talk about notable characters... Of course, we are going to talk about Sigismund. So I figured we could talk about all the stone men, pretty much. Other than maybe Alexis Pollux, unfortunately, because we, we've already talked about him. <laughs> I'll probably bring him back up again. A oh, time or two. Yes, I know, Yuxin, he's one of your favorites. It'll probably be like in the middle of a conversation. We'll be just like, the great you know? Pollux. I mean, seriously. <laughs> exactly. But until then, anyways, you're just going to have to wait. But before we actually kind of discuss how Doran got along with the rest of his brothers, we do have to discuss the Kurz incident. Must we? Yeah. Yes, we must. <laughs> now, if we ever do a Vox on Conrad Kurz, it'll probably be a one-off. Because both of us aren't really big fans of the Night Lords. Right, Yuxin? Right. I mean, they're like... They're kind of the worst. But <laughs> anyways... Well, no, then, they're crooks, murderers, terrorists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Scum of <laughs> you, Milky Way. And they've been turned into space marines. Yep. Uh, but anyways, getting back to Kurz, one thing you have to understand about Conrad Kurz is he's kind of a prophet. 
He sees the future, but he cannot tell when or why things happen. He just knows they'll happen. Kurz had a continuing of this plague with visions of his own death and of his legion fighting its brother Astartes. As his mental anguish grew, so did his legion's dark reputation. Learning of the fate of his homeworld, the Night Hunter tried to confide in his brother Primarchs, but he'd never really been close to them, and their reaction was less than favorable to his claims. Events eventually reached a head following the pacification of the Cherut system, a joint imperial compliance action conducted by the Night Lords, Emperor's children, and the Imperial Fist legions. Suffering from one of his violent fits, Fulgrim rushed to Kurz's aid. The Night Lord's Primarch then confided in his brother of the dire visions that he had seen, his death at the hands of their father, and many of the Primarchs would die fighting amongst themselves, and though the light of the Emperor brought to his homeworld in Nostromo would destroy it forever. Troubled by these dire portents, Fulgrim confided in the worst person possible, Rogel Dorn. Rogel took exception to this slight on the Emperor's name and confronted Kurz. Shortly thereafter, Dorn was found unconscious and bleeding with great gouges of flesh ripped from his torso. Crouching above his fallen brother was the pallid form of the Night Haunter, weeping. Racked with self-loathing and guilt, Kurz was taken into custody and exiled to his chambers, while his brother Primarchs discussed what actions to take against their deeply disturbed brother. Hours later, when the Council of Primarchs finally disbanded, they found the Night Haunter missing, and the Imperial Fist Huscarls, honor guard, that had been watching over him, butchered. By the time the Primarchs gave chase, the Night Haunter had already disappeared with his legion into the warp. Yes, now that we have that sorted, you want to know what I think of Dorn's relationship with his brothers? <laughs> yes, actually, I do. What do you think? Um, I gotta wonder... My opinion would be interesting on how he viewed Alpharius. I think, okay, so with Rogel Dorn, I think, I think one of the problems Dorn had was is that, like we said, anyways, he's kind of he's kind of prideful. I think he's very self centered too, on what he and his legion are doing. So while Rabute Gilliman got all bent out of shape with <laughs> Alpharius wage war, I think Rogel Dorn really didn't care. He's like, well, is he still? conquering galaxies cool it's not my concern it'd Which, also be interesting to say how well an imperial fist world run by dorn would handle an invasion by alpha legion i think that'd be interesting that would be interesting but i mean okay i meant more like along the lines anyways of what you think anyways um, his relationship is anyways with his brothers well I don't think he'd have a bad relationship with Vulcan because I don't think anybody had a bad relationship with Vulcan. I think the worst you could say anyways about a relationship with Vulcan would be is, is very much like I just said anyways with Alpharius. He just, they never really did anything together. So what is Well, care? that's true because I think the Emperor specifically kept those two and the Space Wolves almost constantly away from each other. I think that's one of the things we found out when we did research on them. The uh, Imperial Fists, the Salamanders, no, and the Salamanders, and... Alpha Legion, and the Space Wolves. Oh, yeah. The Triumvirate, or whatever they call them. Well, yeah, and a lot of that, I think, had to do with the fact that they're, they're the ones that they played a little bit more with their gene seeds. Yeah. But like I was saying, anyways, I, I think Vulcan, anyway, I, th I think there's quite a few Primarchs that, quite frankly... Vulcan and Ro a lot of Primarchs, anyways, that Rogel Dorn just didn't come into a whole lot of contact with. Vulcan's oh, one of them. Alpharius is another. Um, Lehman Russ. But when I think of I think of people, okay, so let, let's look at the people, anyways, that we do know that he really came in contact with a lot. So obviously, later on, Sanguinius and uh, the Khan. Horus. Horus, yes. The Khan, he didn't actually. It wasn't until much later, right, that he actually dealt with them a lot. Yeah. I mean, and that was okay. because of the fact that, you know, he was able to get back there. Let's, you know what? Let's let's, let's do it this way, anyways. Instead of going through all the Primarchs, let's just go ahead and jump a little bit forwards, anyways, to the Ulanor Triumph, right? All right. So during the Ulanor Triumph, you had eight Primarchs there, right? So you've got Rogel Dorn. You've got Sanguinius, 
Angron, the Khan, Fulgrim, uh, Magnus, the Reds there, Lorgar, and uh, Horus, obviously. Okay. <laughs> and I believe Mortarian was there too. Yeah. That's nine. Yeah. <laughs> so out of all these guys, out of these guys, out of these guys, anyways, there's this great feast, right? And they're all drinking and carrying on together. How do you think Rogel Dorn w- would hang out with these guys? Probably not all with Lorgar. I think he would just sit there patiently, just kind of go, yeah, uh-huh, interesting. As Lorgar just kind of talking. No, he him. wouldn't because he doesn't lie. Oh, right. So he'd probably just sit there and just stare at him until he left. <laughs> just give him a glare. Just keep sitting there and waiting until he leaves. Like, finally, now I can drink this Finrisian ale. You know? Or whatever. Uh Horace, I think I think we, we already kind of explained this. Horace he's actually fairly chummy with. He's one of the few, anyways, but Horace kind of had that he had that going for him. He was kind of chummy with everybody other than ironically Lehman Russ. He didn't like Lehman Russ. <laughs> it was kind of always, anyways, there's something off about that boy. <laughs> when it came to Horace and Lehman Russ. <laughs> uh and wasn't he technically like the second one found was Lehman Russ? Yeah, and Lehman was just like, you're kind of, brother. Okay, it's kind of like the first brother and the second brother. Yeah. And Lehman Russ was just kind of like, brother! And Horace is like, don't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> you smell, you know, or whatever. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think anyways, he probably starts slowly kind of like hanging out more with 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 Horace. Uh which means, anyways, he probably, anyways, would be very polite, I guess. Refrain, but polite, anyways, with Fulgrim. Uh, he probably would listen, actually. He probably would listen to Fulgrim, because, like we said, Fulgrim's kind of the rumor mill, right? So, at least he gets some information out of him. Um, we haven't heard anything specifically when it comes to him and Magnus. It's a good point. It didn't seem like he really had a say anyways when it came to the, uh, um, oh shoot, what were they, what do they call that? Council of Nakia. Thank you. Yeah. The Council of Nakia. It didn't seem like he was for or against it. He just kind of remained neutral. Well, I so, mean, even just from what we know, he didn't seem to have a particular, um, hatred. You know, Magnus did it. Magnus, I can't remember who Magnus even really liked. Well, Magnus was good friends, ironically, with Sanguinius and the Khan. Yeah, I knew he was great with the Khan. Really as far as I Khan. know, the only person that Dorn really called friend was Horus and then probably Sanguinius. But that's because everybody likes Sanguinius, too. <laughs> San- Sanguinius, ironically, actually also got along with Lehman Russ. So, I mean, Sanguinius... Well, Horus, anyways, was chummy with everybody. Sanguinius, everybody kind of liked. So... <laughs> And, they, and he and he got along with everybody. And then Vulcan was like the grandpa. <laughs> he he's the big old yeah, he's the big guy in the back, anyways, that just kind of very much actually like Rogel Dorn in the sense that he didn't talk a whole lot, very reserved. But instead of being, you know, I, I look at Dorn being more pompous than Vulcan. Vulcan yeah. very much more uh, of, like you said, like a grandfather sitting in the back anyways, and every once in a while would just kind of smile, pet somebody on the back, you know, kind of thing, and be just like... You did great, son. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you did great, boy, you know? <laughs> yeah, Rogel, I think anyways, the biggest... Next time, problem... go around the left, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think the biggest problem that Rogel Dorn had, quite frankly, was the simple fact anyways that he just... He was very much more focused anyways on the Imperial Guard or the Im- Imperial Fist and what he was doing. Screw the Imperial Guard. <laughs> yeah, we, we find out later. He he does like to use them as meat shields. But <laughs> just that I think anyways, he kind of, and I think a lot of his brothers would have liked to gotten them know him better. Like for instance, Rebute Gilliman. I think anyways, they, if they could actually, you know, really get into a conversation and really hang out, they might actually see more eye to eye, but I think Rogel Dorn kind of kept his brothers a little bit more at a distance. Um, not, not, not in the sense anyways, that some of the other Primarchs did like the line, the line was just kind of like, you know, he's out doing his own thing, but 
I, I do think anyways that it, it kind of made it hard to get to know Rogel Dorn, I guess. Right. Now, now here's, I guess, my uh, my last question on the subject anyways of his brothers anyways. Who do you think anyways out of his brothers really did actually want to get to know him but just never really got the chance? Oh, I have no idea. I okay. can't think of any of them wanting to really get to know him. Well, I, I, I would assume anyways, like, for instance, Lehman Russ would enjoy having a beer with him. <laughs> uh, but then again, I think anyways, as long as the other Primark is paying, Lehman Russ would enjoy having a beer with anybody. <laughs> well, first off, if you think about it, how are any of them getting bashed except for unless Lehman Russ brought so sort of that Fenrisian? You mean smashed? Yeah. Bashed? <laughs> Well, that too, but uh, <laughs> no, I was just thinking, it was like, who's clunking these Primarchs? Oh, no, no, you mean, you mean like drinking wise? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying, well, think about it though. I'm not saying that they're, 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 they're gonna get trashed anyways at this, this triumph. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, anyways, that you know, no, 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 the only reason why that pops to my head is because you know, you see all these portraits of them like drinking together or whatever. You're going, wait a sec. You think about it, it's like, wait a sec. What pictures are you talking about? I don't think I've ever seen a picture of any of them drinking. Ever. <laughs> Even the picture I have of the Ulanor Triumph, it's all of them anyways, and they're standing at this grand pavilion. <laughs> no one has a beer. It's actually rather <laughs> sad. <laughs> but <laughs> I just especially anyways when, when when we get into farther on anyways with like the siege of terra and whatnot anyways where he has to actually figure out ways to use his brothers in the combat and sanguinius anyways it seems like he has a little bit more of a repertoire with than the con <laughs> the uh, is like fine do whatever you want <laughs> originally he doesn't oh, we'll get into that later but i think he actually gains a little bit more respect for the con anyways during the siege of terra because it's kind of one of those like, oh wow, that actually worked. <laughs> and but before, before that, he's going, no, don't do that, don't do that. Oh, well, well okay. like I said before, once we get to like the siege of Terra, there is a very drastic shift in Rogel Dorn's character because it's the first time he technically loses. I mean, they do win. I mean, because you know, horse doesn't win, but. He technically loses. <laughs> so it's like the first time it happens. It's it's a shell shock, you know? <laughs> so but it and and I wish that he'd actually lived longer after that because or didn't disappear well, after that because yeah. his character just so drastically changes and he becomes much more like Alexis Pollux. He gains that ability, anyways, of a little bit more humility. And I think that makes him a very much more approachable character. And much more approachable brother to the Primarchs anyways that are still there. So I think it would be very interesting to, to read into anyways what they thought of him kind of after this anyways and how he dealt with them. But beforehand, I absolutely agree with you anyways. He is very, he's very quiet, very standoffish. There's only a few people he really talks to other than, of course, anyways, when it has to deal with war. And with war, on the other hand, anyways, he's just kind of like, this is the way it's supposed to go. And people can argue their points. They can they can say whatever they want, anyways. And he's just like, no, nah, this is the way it's supposed to go. And occasionally, anyways, he can see anyways where he is he's wrong about something. He's like, okay, fine, I guess that'll work. <laughs> you know, I think you're wrong, but hey, yes, I, I think you're wrong, but but you might be right. So we'll get. I guess we'll go for the the convenience of diplomacy. We'll go with your idea. Oh, it worked. Yeah, well, you know. He, I don't think anyways he would have ever gotten along with uh, Corvus Corax, <laughs> the goth kid, and <laughs> the, the quarterback. Yeah, no, I don't see that one working. <laughs> or for that matter, if you think about him trying to do coordinate with Alpha Legion, either. Oh, okay. I don't really see that. Before we move, like, on. what we're gonna do is we're gonna build this wall here. But why don't we just completely screw them over so we don't even need to build a wall? 
But I like building walls. Because we build <laughs> walls. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we and, commit siege, but they won't have anybody to defend anymore. So, okay, so before we move, out, move on actually to the Siege of Terra, we do have to talk about one other brother anyways, and we did briefly, I did briefly talk about it. Ferris Manus. So Ferris Manus is very similar to both Perturabo and Rogel Dorn. In, kind, in, in a lot, they do have a lot of similarities on the concept of, of um, what they do warfare wise. They all like building things. They're all engineers. They all like this kind of stuff. The one thing, though, that I that, that made it so blatantly obvious there's a huge difference between Rogel Dorn and Ferris Manus is just Ferris Manus is kind of a hothead. He tends to lose his head quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, I love that joke. But anyways, apparently, since you get pretty much every single time that we talk about him, oh yes, oh yes, 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 he's trying to get ahead, <laughs> but just never can quite do that. <laughs> never quite ahead above the rest. Above the rest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but so after this whole Astrani Empire thing, what do you think, anyways? Their dynamic was. How do you think that they looked at each other anyways the next time they saw each other? Because they obviously had differences in opinion. But one of the things that I do like about Ferris Manus is that while he is quick-tempered, he, it also cools quickly. Yeah. Kind of interesting. So Which is probably why, like in that story, how he eventually yields and he tells his guy to yield instead of just going, no, just finish. To the bitter end! Yes, yeah. no, he doesn't do that. So... What do you think, anyways, the dynamics between these two is? Probably be we're co-workers, <laughs> but we don't have to be like each other. <laughs> okay. So we are just going to stay neutral. <laughs> so it's not so it's... I'll work with you, but <laughs> once we're done, we're done. So if it's like you were talking to Ferris Manus and he was like, what do you think of Rogel Dorn? Oh, he's a good, he's a good employee. He's a good worker. Yeah, he's a good co-worker. Okay. <laughs> he's a good co-worker. Really? Oh, what do you think about his characteristics or anything? He's a good worker. He's a good co-worker. <laughs> yeah. He builds walls really well. Yeah. Okay. Faster <laughs> than your average person. <laughs> yeah. And if you said it, well, okay, now here's the weird part, though. If you ask the same thing to Rogel Dorn, Rogel Dorn can't lie. What do you think Rogel Dorn would say? He'd probably say, he'd probably say he's a good co-worker. Not necessarily <laughs> the best, but he'd probably say, yeah, he's a good, he's a good co-worker. co-worker. Not the best. A little bit of a temper, but, you know. <laughs> Some people have that problem. Yeah. Do you have that problem? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, anyways, a little bit of ride in there with, with Mr. Rogel. Now, if we're going to talk about Dorn, we must delve into the Siege of Terra and how important the Primarch was to the defense of man. Quite right, brother. But before we get carried away with everything that took place with the Solar War and the Siege itself, we've got to quickly discuss the Battle of Pluto. Now, during the subsequent Battle of Pluto, Alpharius confronted Rogel Dorn in a chamber locked inside of the Hydra Fortress moon in Pluto's orbit. What caused this was Horus had tasked Alpharius with covertly entering the Sol system and gathering as much data on the defenses of the system, all the while trying to cause as much mischief and havoc as possible. Uh, things were actually going pretty well for the Alpha Legion, until an Imperial fist by the name of Archamus discovered Alpharius and began to hunt him down with a group of Imperial fists. Alpharius killed Archimus's team, but left Archimus mortally wounded and alive to watch as Dorn teleported into the chamber. Both Dorn's Haskarls and Alpharius's Lernians teleported in, and the Primarch slaughtered the other's warriors. The two battled, with Alpharius dealing Dorn many wounds, using his speed to stay out of reach. Throughout the fight, he tried to convince Dorn that he was there to teach him how to win, to expose his weaknesses, that he could not win the current war, and how there needed to be a new type of war. He also claimed that Dorn didn't understand what he was fighting for, and they both cared about the future. Only he knew the truth regarding the conflict, and he did not fight for Horus, but for Dorn instead. 
Eventually, he did try to kill Dorne with a blow from his Saracenata, or Pale Spear. Yet Archimus saw the strike and tried to intervene, but reeled harmlessly off the spear's haft. Archimus was unaware that Dorne had seen the strike, and the Imperial Fist Primarch outplaying Alpharius by using a move he'd used against a giant orc decades earlier by stepping into the shot and tanking it in his shoulder to pin Alpharius in place. He then grabbed the spear and sliced Alpharius' hands from his wrists before slashing him across the chest, stabbing him with his own spear, and finishing by cutting through Alpharius' skull with his mighty chainsword, Storm's Teeth. Archimus soon passed away, but a team under his second, Castros, found the Primarch and the now-deceased Archimus. Dorne then hid from the loyalist Alpharius' appearance within the system and his death, promoting Castros and others with direct knowledge of the events to the Haskarls to replace those who had died. Dorne sought to deny Alpharius any acknowledgement or honor. Far away, Omega sensed the death of his twin, and he grew distant. Upon being notified that Horus demanded to speak with Alpharius, Omegan took up the name and became his twin brother. Alpharius, or at least an Alpha Legionnaire claiming to be him, reappeared alone on Ulanor during the muster of traitor forces there in preparation for the Siege of Terra. No other Alpha Legion forces were present in system, making many other traitors wonder how Alpharius could even have been there at all. Before Horus's dark triumph on Ulanor, Alpharius appeared in the War Master's command tent and gave him a cylinder which contained a detailed layout of all of the Soul System's defenses and infrastructure. Alpharius then took out a dagger and shattered it in his hand, throwing the pieces at Horus's feet before leaving. Abaddon demanded that Horus kill him for such insolence, but the War Master instead let Alpharius go. I mean, this needed to be discussed, yet I hate to admit it, we really can't go too far into this. If you want to know more, feel free to check out our Vox, Alpharius and Omega, the twin Primarch. Quite right, brother, but we must press on. Tell us about the Solar War and what all Dorne did in it. Now, to best explain how things went during the final phase of the Solar War, aka Horses, Traitor Legion, Armada attacking, I must talk about Dorne's five spheres of Soul System defenses. Each consisted of not only Imperial Fist's forces, but also Loyalist Imperial Army and Mechanicum. By the closing phase of the battle, Dorne held back most of his Astarte's forces on Terra in preparation for the siege. The first sphere was the outermost defensive zone from Pluto to Neptune. It was commanded by First Captain Sigismund at Pluto, or Sigi. Uh, <laughs> the second sphere oversaw Uranus. It was commanded by Fleetmaster Halbrach. The third sphere oversaw the Jupiter region. It was commanded by Seneschal Efrid. The fourth sphere was commanded by Siege Master Kamba Diaz and oversaw the blockade of traitor occupied Mars. This sphere was the largest of the four outer layers of defense, surpassed only by the Terran sphere. The fifth sphere was Terra and Luna, overseen by the Primarch himself. And so we start the final phase with the Traitor Legion's Armada's arrival on the first day of the first month of 14.M31. As expected by the Loyalists, the Traitors made their initial assaults on the two warp gates into the system that allowed for the bypass of Mandeville points. The Chthonic Gate at Pluto and the Legion Gate at Uranus. Near simultaneously, a Sons of Horus Armada under Horus Aximen struck at Pluto, while an Iron Warrior fleet under Perturabo assaulted the defense of Uranus, both engaging the Imperial Fists and Imperial Armada defense fleets under Siggy and Halbrecht, respectively. At the same time, an Armada of Sons of Horus, Thousand Sons, Word Bearers, and Dark Mechanicum under Ezekiel Abaddon. Azek Araman and Zardu Leek and Sota Null, respectively, moved over the galactic disk, bypassing the initial loyalist defenses and striking down into the upper crest of the defensive spheres. The loyalists had foreseen such a ploy, and a force of white scars under Jubal Khan was ready to meet the traitors. 
Across the solar system, hundreds of small engagements erupted to make up a naval battle of titanic proportions. The Loyalists had the advantage of preparations and large amounts of orbital defense platforms and other armored bastions. The Traders had the luxury of overwhelming numbers and warp sorcery. Right, now to break down how things went by sphere. Indeed. At Pluto commanding from the frigate Lacrimae, Sigismund decimated the initial waves of primary traitor Imperial Army vessels, which arrived through the Chthonic Gate, with not only his fleet, but also the moons of the world, which had now been transformed into gigantic gun fortresses. However, as the traitors arrived in ever-increasing numbers, the Sons of Horus finally began to appear, using the ships of their allies as shields to begin to fire back. Soon Horus Aximon himself, aboard the battle barge, Throne of the Underworld, translated from the warp, leading a massive push that saw landings on the fortress moons. Most of the incoming attacks were by savage newborn sons of Horus. One by one, the newborn Astartes boarded the moons and unleashed scrap code that either disabled its defenses or turned them to Horus's cause, resulting in the moons beginning to fire on one another. After the moon of Keberus fell, Sigismund ordered his fleet to retreat. The Sons of Horus pursued, walking into the Loyalist trap as Sigismund had Loyalist Mechanicum Tech Priests unleash data gins into the power reactor complex of the moon. Kerberos exploded, decimating and scattering the pursuing traitor fleet. At this moment, Sigismund had his fleet turned back around and launched a vicious counterattack on the traitors. In an attempt to reverse the situation, Aximon personally led an assault onto the Lacrimae to decapitate the Loyalist command. In a clash between the Sons of Horus and Sigismund's Templars, Aximon and Sigismund dueled. Horus Aximon slew the Templar Lieutenant Boris and wounded Sigismund, but the first captain of the Imperial Fist was able to teleport away aboard the nearby frigate Persephone, severing one of Aximon's hands as he retreated. Though wounded, Aximon successfully captured the Lacrimae and organized a counterattack that broke the Loyalist fleet of Pluto. Sigismund ordered a withdrawal towards Terra, informing Rogel Dorn that the First Sphere had fallen after several days of fighting. So not long after the First Sphere came under assault, Pertrabo himself aboard the Iron Blood oversaw a massive traitor onslaught of over 4,000 vessels through the Legion Gate on Halbrecht's Second Sphere fleet and orbital defenses, striking at the Second Sphere. Commanding the battle barge Monarch of Fire, Halbrecht's fleet took a ranged approach, sniping from the screen of 27 fortress moons and hundreds of gun platforms into the rival points of Iron Warrior vessels with their Nova cannons. Enormous space minefields hindered the traitor fleet, boxing them into these kill zones. Per travel ran three enormous mass conveyor vessels known as Electo, Magera, and Tilfausia into the Loyalist fleet of gun platforms, using them as fire ships and wiping out many of the defenders. With the way to the inner core of Uranus's defenses cleared, Pertrabo fielded an enormous space hulk known as the Daughter of Woe, which unleashed hell on the Loyalists with its enormous array of weaponry. One by one, the remaining defensive bastions of Uranus fell to the Iron Warrior's onslaught, with the firepower from the Daughter of Woe devastating the moons, Umbriel, Cordelia, and Oberon. As the Iron Warriors closed the distance with the Loyalist Defenders' bastions, they unleashed transports filled with millions of drug-fueled gangers, pirates, mutants, and cultists into their bowels. The defending forces, mostly Imperial Army and Servitors, fought valiantly but were overwhelmed by sheer numbers. After a delaying maneuver that brought another 36 hours for the Loyalists, Halbrecht ordered a retreat towards Terra. He brought with him the majority of the Second Sphere fleet, saved in order to bloody the traitors in future engagements. The Second Sphere had fallen. Now, with the Second Sphere reduced... There were still thousands of pockets of resistance between Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and outer Jupiter, and their accompanying moons and orbitals. To speed up the conquest of Sol, 
Pernarabo unleashed waves of pirates, emperor's children, and night lord vessels, as well as ships of traitor space marines, which had since taken new colors or names. Though Titan had been cloaked in a ritual by Malkador for a future project, the rest of Saturn and Neptune were terrorized by these vicious bands of killers, while Pernarabo, alongside his first captain, Forex, led an assault on Jupiter itself which was defended primarily by Imperial Fists, Imperial Army, and Blood Angel vessels under Captain Ifrid. In addition, the majority of the Second Sphere fleet, which had been held from the battle at Uranus, were finally committed to the battle. Ifrid and Halbrecht's fleets slowly gave ground to the Iron Warriors in the vast expanse of Jupiter and her moons, eventually being forced to withdraw to Terra once the overall situation in the Sol System collapsed. Amidst the carnage erupting across the outer Sol system, Horus's most important maneuver came above the galactic disk. The combined Sons of Horus, Thousand Sons, Word Bearer, and Dark Mechanicum fleet plunged into the void between Terra and Mars. This force then split in half with the larger Dark Mechanicum contingents making for Mars, while the traitor Astarius force moved towards Luna. Along the way to Luna, Abaddon's armada was continually harried by the White Scars and Jubal Khan. However, Abaddon and Zardu Layak were eventually able to board the White Scars flagship Lance of Heaven and slay Jubal in combat. At Mars, the large Dark Mechanicum fleet, drawn from hundreds of treacherous forge worlds, plowed into Cambodia's blockade fleet. Consisting of a large number of Imperial Fists, Blood Angels, Loyalist Mechanicum, and Imperial Army, this force was the largest of the four outer spheres, and a vicious battle erupted over the Red Planet. From the Battle Barge Fortress of Eternity, Camba Diaz had to deal with attacks on both sides of his fleet at Kelbor Hall's besieged Martian forces, launched their own attack in conjunction with the arriving Dark Mechanicum Armada. Understanding the time for counterattack had arrived, Dorna's command staff moved to the Phalanx, which finally left Terra's orbit and intended to contest the traitors at Luna and then Maws. Jekatai Khan stated that the traitors had failed, as Horus's main fleet had yet to show itself and the firepower of the phalanx would blunt this new attack, buying the loyalists enough time for Gilliman's arrival. Meanwhile, Azak Araman's Thousand Sons Force, accompanied by word bearers and their cultist slaves under the apostle of the unspeaking, moved on the comet between Venus and Terra, capturing it from Light's Heritor defenses and beginning a great sacrificial ritual prepared on the orders of Lorgar years prior. The ritual depended on an absolute timetable, having to be initiated at a precise celestial alignment in the soul system that had not been seen since the Age of Strife. As Aramon and the Word Bearers conducted their ritual, Abaddon's remaining Sons of Horus contingent emerged over Luna. The moon's defensive ring sported defenses greater than the entire expeditionary fleet, and with the phalanx inbound, Abaddon's relatively small fleet seemed doomed to a quick death. However, at the exact moment that Armand's ritual on the comet was reaching its crescendo, Abaddon plunged his battle barge, War Oath, into the defensive ring around Luna as he and his warriors teleported aboard the moon's surface. The kamikaze attack blew a 20-kilometer-long gap into Luna's defensive ring as Aramon departed the comet, which became an epicenter for a massive black scar in reality, which briefly plucked out the sun itself. From the tear and real space came tens of thousands of traitor vessels, including the full might of the world eaters, dozen sons and emperor's children. Besides conventional warships, this force also included hordes of winged demons. At the head of this impossibly vast armada's head was Angron, standing atop the battlements of the Conqueror. Fulgrim aboard the pride of the Emperor, and Horus himself commanding the vengeful spirit. 
The new rivals trek towards Luna, annihilating and scattering battle fleet solar and lunar defensive networks. On Luna's surface, a Justeran and word bearers assault under Abaddon and Laic. Eventually succeed in securing the coveted Selenar gene seed technology that had been used to create the original Stardates. The presiding Selenar matriarch, Heliosa 78, ultimately chose to side with Horus, then carry out her orders from Dorne to destroy her precious gene tech before it could fall into traitor hands. Dorne attempted to organize a counterattack aboard the Phalanx. But another one of Horace's trump cards took effect. The remember, sir, Mercedes Oliton, who had been brought aboard the battle station by Garbio Loken due to an urgent need to speak to the Primarch, was revealed to have been unknowingly corrupted by Malogurst years prior. From a warp eye placed on her, the demon Samus emerged directly into the bowels of the phalanx. Dorne's own command bridge was assailed by both demonic hordes and Samus's madness, and in desperation, the Primarch unleashed his librarians, which had been interred aboard the station since the Council of Nakia. Not even the arrival of Siggy's reinforcements from Pluto could turn the tide. But every time the demon died, he was reborn by possessing one of the many nearby corpses. To end Samus's rampage, a distraught Oliton threw herself into the phalanx's reactor chamber, with her death closing the portal from which the demons were able to manifest. Though the phalanx was now secure, victory in the soul system was now impossible. Mars was rapidly being relieved, and horses' armadas were closing in all around them. Dorne ordered the Imperial Army Admiral Nyora Su Kassan, take the phalanx out into the outer solar system in order to save it from certain destruction. While he returned to Terra aboard Siggy's frigate Persephone, the surviving loyalist vessels in Luna's orbit either fled into the void or docked in Terra's atmosphere. With the solar system now in his hands, Horus was finally able to strike at the throne world itself. After a little over a month of fighting, on the 13th day of Secundus, the first orbital strikes from Horus's fleet fell upon Terra. The siege of Terra had begun. Now, during the final battle on Terra's surface, Dorne was charged with the overall command of the defenses of the Imperial Palace, personally commanding the effort from the Bahab Bastion and later the Sky Fortresses. During the earlier stages of the battle, he attempted to maintain a sense of normalcy by allowing the Council of Terra to meet within the Great Chamber of the Senatorium Imperialis. But in truth, he was completely occupied by the traitor siege. He forbade his brothers, Sanguidius and Jagatai Khan, from leaving the palace walls and planned to instead bleed Horus's forces in a protracted siege to buy time for Rebute Gilliman's expected arrival. However, he later relented on his plan to not allow the deployment of his best troops outside the palace, opening the Helios Gate of the palace and allowing Sanguinius to lead a counterattack by the Blood Angels, Imperial Fists, and Legio Solaria to rescue the Imperial Army conscripts being overrun outside. Yet again, Astro Militarum is the meat shield. <laughs> During the battle for Terra's Lion Gate spaceport, Dorn put Fafnir Ran in charge of the defenses, but was later forced to send Sigismund to lead in reinforcements. Uh, pardon me, brother, but why wasn't Siggy in charge to begin with? It would have been my choice. Yeah. <laughs> Sigismund was kind of on the outs with Dorn by this point. Uh. Uh, okay, we'll go into this, I guess, a little bit. But uh, Sigismund, at this point, was thinking that the Emperor was a god. I know it sounds silly now anyways that because that's what everybody in the Imperium thinks other than a lot of actually space marine chapters. But Sigismund anyways, it was pretty much a full devotee anyways as, as the Emperor is a god. Dorn never thought of the Emperor as a god. So and he was a firm believer of the Imperial truth. So right. they kind of had a falling out pretty much. It was one of the reasons, by the way, why he was it was in charge of Pluto all the way on the other side of the galaxy. <laughs> Dorne just didn't want to deal with him. He was he was very upset with his child. 
his son. But <clears throat> anyways, during this period, Dorne confronted Euphrates Keeler over her proto-imperial cult. But the future saint refused to back down and insisted she would aid the defense of Terra through faith. She decided to send Sigismund on a crusade to slay Abaddon, something which infuriated Dorne. Later, as Sigismund faced death at the hands of Karn and the traitors, were overrunning the spaceport, Dorne took to the field himself to allow time for the loyalists to withdraw. He easily bested Karn, swatting away the Chosen of Korn like an insect. It was then that Perturabo set down on the field from the Iron Blood, and Dorne attempted to go the Lord of Iron into a personal duel in order to buy time. However, Perturabo refused to be baited by Dorne's taunts, promising to only slay his brother after Terra's defenses had been subdued. Dorne responded that Perturabo had spent an immense amount of lives to merely take the first wall, and many more awaited. Despite the fall of the spaceport, Dorne was not distraught, as he had held it longer than he expected and knew all that mattered was to hold on just a little bit longer until Gilliman's arrival. Yet after the fall of the Lion's Gate, the strategic situation for the Loyalists worsened, and four key areas were now threatened. The Colossi Gate, Saturnine Gate, the Gorgon Bar, and Eternity Wall Spaceport. However, the Loyalists only had enough resources to defend three of these sites. Dorne was thus faced with a difficult decision of abandoning one of its defenders with it, eventually choosing the spaceport. While stopping Kyrell Cinderman from possible suicide attempt, the Remembrancer's words made Dorne realize that he had overlooked the flaw in the Saturnine Gate that Perturabo could possibly exploit. Dorne thus set a trap for the traders at Saturnine as he prepared to abandon the Eternity Wall spaceport. At the height of the battle for Saturnine, Dorne saved Sigismund from his fallen brother Fulgrim and the two Primarchs coming to battle. With Fulgrim in his human state, Dorne was able to resist his constant goading, match his swordsmanship, and land mortal blows. However, Fulgrim quickly regenerated and laughed off the damage. Dorne then informed Fulgrim of his trap and that Abaddon's subterranean assault had failed. Fulgrim then became fed up with his allies and quit the battle, though not before summoning his elite god led by Edelon to assassinate the Primarch. With the help of Sigismund, Dorne was able to survive the battle. He next took direct command of the Shard Bastion, along with the Mercury Exultant Kilzo, organizing defenses against the massive Legio Mortis assault alongside 400 Imperial Fists. Three months into the siege, Rogaldorn had not slept or even rested for a single moment. The strain finally caught up with even his superhuman biology, and he began to slow. Admitting the war effort was lost, he nonetheless continued his work and did not oppose when Jagatai Khan launched a counterattack to retake the Lion's Gate spaceport. While admiring the Khan's ultimate achievement and seeming sacrifice, he did not think the recapture of the port would change the battle's outcome. With the Loyalist positions collapsing across the Inner Palace, Dorne soon found his own Lahab Bastion under siege by traitor forces and fought alongside Sigismund and Fafnir Ron. Mere hours after Sanguinius' stand at the Eternity Gate, the Lahab Bastion fell to the massive assault led by the Sons of Horus. Dorne was forced to conducting a chaotic retreat back to the Sanctum Imperialis, while well, many of his staff and sons were slain. He subsequently took part in the last-ditch teleportation assault aboard the Vengeful Spirit, but upon arrival aboard the Blighted Vessel, became trapped in an endless sweltering desert. Now, um, <clears throat> this is where things get a little weird. But <laughs> anyways, for what seemed to him to be centuries, Dorn endured the desert, completely alone, save for the corpses of his sons all around him. Slowly, he began to lose his memories, eventually only remembering his own name as Korn attempted to corrupt his soul. Dorn remained trapped within the desert for untold mortal lifetimes, continually being tempted by a voice bade him to give in to Korn. Dorn, though, forgetful of much of his identity and history, was nonetheless able to maintain his sanity by reciting old historical passages and scratching battle plans into the black wall of the desert. Such was his stubbornness that even the voice of Korn grew frustrated by his inability to corrupt the Primarch. However, Dorn was able to finally escape when the Emperor gave up the power 
he had built up as the proto Dark King, purifying the madness sweeping across both Terra and the vengeful spirit. As Doran found himself within the inevitable city, his full memories were restored, and he discovered Actia trapped beneath rubble. You catch all that, Euxen? You understand <laughs> what's going on here? Because I sure don't. <laughs> I, I'm still stuck on desert with a black wall. <laughs> desert. Oh, that's where we lost you. Okay. I kind of got lost with the proto Dark King. Because I don't actually. Well, I kept know thinking is. it's a desert. Why does it have a black wall? Uh, Why does it have a wall, period? It's a desert. <laughs> Anyways, despite being free from that black wall desert, the endless centuries within Horus's trap had rendered Dorne prone to worrying, pessimistic thoughts, and a tendency to reflect upon the past. After leaving Actia, Dorne continued through the inevitable city and eventually found himself back aboard the Vengeful Spirit as Valdor and his custodes fought against the counterattack by Abaddon. Dorne was able to break the gridlock and allowed Valdor and himself to escape to Lubricle's court, where they discovered Garviel Loken and Lietu as the only ones standing. Horus lay dead, and the Emperor was grievously wounded. Dorne and the furious Valdor argued over what to do next. Dorne agreed with Lietu, who had found a tarot card of the throne near the Emperor's body and interpreted it as a sign that the Emperor must be placed back onto the Golden Throne. Dorne, Valdor, and the other survivors teleported back into the palace, and the Emperor took his seat on the Golden Throne for the next 10,000 years. Uh, by the way, just a quick mention here anyways, not all the other survivors teleported back. Garvia Loken stayed stuck behind, and unfortunately gets stabbed by our good friend, Erebus. That's how he dies. But anyways, before we get finished up with Dorne, what do you think of his dealings in the Siege of Terra? I find it funny how it keeps coming back to the fact that he believes in the imperial truth. But yet, he places his faith in a tarot card. Yeah, yeah it's... <sighs> I, I, I wonder what would have happened if it wasn't a throne, but something entirely different. <laughs> like an old guy with a cane or something like that. <laughs> Or, or death. If it's the death card, it's like, crap. We're all screwed now. But Or the know, tower. Like, we don't have any towers left. What do we do? <laughs> I meant more along the lines of what do you think of his defenses? So we've got three Primarchs, right? That that they could have chosen one of them anyways to lead, this, lead the defenses, right? And they picked Dorn, which makes I, sense. Makes sense. But do you think either the other the other uh, uh, Primarchs would have done a better job? Um, judging by their expertise, no. I do think it was smart of him not to keep trying to hold back the con, but uh, that's partially because of the fact that um, he really is somebody that's a fast attack person which is completely different than staying behind a wall. <laughs> I think I think that was probably one of his worst flaws in this whole defense. He didn't let the con kind of do what the con does. Yeah, until finally the con just went, I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah, well, and, I mean, do, could Dorn have stopped him? Sure, why not? But at that point, anyways, I think he was just kind of like, yeah, I'll do whatever you want to do. And then it worked. And he's like, oh, oh well, let me know. <laughs> <sighs> I'm wrong again. Great. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a new thing. <laughs> I, I mean, as opposed to maybe, I guess. Okay, I don't know as much about the Blood Angels as I do about the White Scars. The Blood Angels, to yeah. me, anyway, seem like they're they're pretty versatile. They're a lot like... Gilliman's boys where they they kind of you can kind of throw them into whatever anyways they don't have like a speciality they're just kind of good at everything um i think they're supposed to be better at close combat than the ultramarines okay I like think. i said i don't know personally a whole lot about yeah. the blood angels we haven't really gotten into them yet we i mean they do pop up occasionally and i did do a, a vox anyways on um oh what was it it was 
the Saturnine rings or something like that, where, uh, uh, where, what's his face? Crap. It Don't was the say. birth. Of, it was the birth of the red angel. No, no, this was during Sanguinius's time. It was the birth of the oh, red angel. I have no idea who that is then. But okay, well, there's there's a there's a pretty famous picture, and I'll pull it up for you guys watching on YouTube. But it's it's like the Council of Horus before they started the siege of Terra, and there's like this guy that's chained up, and he's like on fire. That's the Red Angel. Okay. Uh, He's like a pretty much a demon possessed space marine. It's probably the best way to describe him. So he's incredibly powerful and downright scary. But, <laughs> anyways, I digress. That was probably the only flaw that I really saw. In what, I mean, because the whole thing with Dorn was is that I think he realized really quickly, anyways, there was no way he was going to be able to stop Horus right. with the forces that he had. He needed to buy time. And I think that's one of the reasons why he kept the the con anyways at bay because he's like, look, we need as many people behind these walls as possible because we're going to bleed them white. We need to buy as much time as possible. And if you get caught out there, we can't come save you. (laughs) I mean, I think that was his biggest fear was just kind of the concept of like, okay, now if you get stuck out there, you get cornered or... Or Horus pulls some sort of maneuver, and all of a sudden you're you're behind enemy lines, and we can't get to you. You know how bad that's going to be for morale, and just the simple fact that anyways that we lose the white scars, we lose another Primarch. Like I can't have that happen. Right. So I think anyways that I can understand why he was cautious about it. It's just that it's the con. I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's. He's he's pretty good at what he does, so yeah. It would have it would have had to taken. I mean, could they have captured the con if he had gone out there by himself? Eh, they they could have. Yeah, it is a possibility. But I, I think it would have been. It was a lot. I think it was significantly smaller than what Dorn was thinking. Put that. Yeah. Way. Uh, I th- I think though the quite honestly this this new information that I found about. Dorn getting stuck in the warp trap with the black wall desert and <laughs> Axia shells up, who I've never really liked. Uh, it's just, it reminds me a lot of trying to do research on John Grammaticus. It's just kind of like, sure, whatever, that happened, you know? <laughs> he was like, there. Yeah. But oh, I think, anyways, though, that the, one of the things, and, and, one of the things that we don't mention here anyways is, is that doesn't like Rebute Gilman after the whole thing that takes place in the eventual spirit, doesn't he just like literally show up like a day or two later? I can't so he remember. was just like right there. If I recall right. I mean, I it, it doesn't really matter because Horus gets blown out of existence and, and the, the traitor legions just kind of break apart because he died. So it wasn't like at that point, actually, I don't think it would have really mattered as much if Gilman had shown up or not, but I think he like was literally right there. So I remember right. The only ones that did a non panicked retreat once Horace died, I think was the death Legion. The the iron warriors did. (laughs) If I recall right, the the ones that really like panicked and fled anyways were, well, first off the sons of Horace. Yeah. They could literally feel their father die, which Okay, I, I I got that, and 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 by this point, anyways, Fulgrim had already left. <laughs> he was just like, "I'm done with this." Ta ta. And Toodle when off. he sends his guard to assassinate, which I I find it, I always find that term weird when somebody just like, "Yes, I will send my best people, which are flashy, to try to assassinate somebody." Well, not only that, but assassin. To me, anyways, I always think of assassination like, you know, you, first off, you're not in combat. I never really yeah. think of assassinations taking place in combat. I Unless mean, it's like when somebody's in combat and then you, like, hit them from afar. Well, even still, anyways, I would say that they died in combat, not they were assassinated. <laughs> they were in combat. There's a good chance of you taking a bullet when you're in combat. So I just I just always kind of picture anyways that if you're going to assassinate somebody, this is normally like murder. <laughs> yeah, it's like 
you're going to be sneaky about are it. sending like 11 people or whatever it is. <laughs> well, you spent along you're with my top captain. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, you're especially not sending like warriors that are gonna truck in there, anyways, and just try to take him out. It's just like, no, that's just that's just trying to kill him, which I mean, yeah, go for it, but <laughs> I just. That's the other thing too. Is is like, like yeah, I take the the honor guard and try to kill Dorn. It's like we we've, we've already established anyways. The Primarchs pretty much they're they're very hard to kill. So the concept of like taking five to ten Space Marines and going, yeah, you got this, and that ain't happening. <laughs> I don't think Dorn really needed Siggy or Sigismund. I mean, it helped, but. <laughs> Kind of like anyways when we talked about anyways with the spear of Russ and Russ ends up impaling Horus and then he takes a blow from Horus and then the, his wolf guard like drag they literally like start just like jumping on Horus and there's like the dog pile him pretty much and he still is able to like slaughter his way out of that so it was like they're they're hard to kill let's put it that way yeah. space Marines are already hard to kill. Primarchs, on the other hand, are even like worse. <laughs> right. But yeah, I I think anyways, Dorn did a very good job here. I don't know. I don't honestly think anyways, maybe Gilman. That's the only other guy I could think of anyways that might have done this defense as well, if not better. It's the only guy I could think of anyways. That's still, you know, a um not a traitor. Right. Maybe Gilman. Maybe. But I mean, th this is this is this is Dorn we're talking about. This is kind of, this is his bread and butter. This is this right. is what he does. So yeah, well, like I said, probably one of the few things I think when it came to uh, protecting the Terra itself that is he should have let the Khan do his thing earlier. Yeah, other I know. I that, but other than that, uh, I don't think there's much else that he could do differently. But that's because I don't know a lot about the blood angels either. Right. I mean, the only other thing you could really think of is, is that if, well, the problem is that he'd have to, it's that whole hindsight 2020, that whole thing anyways, where Abaddon like suicide launches in that activates this whole warp storm thing. So the rest of the guys can show up. I mean, if you knew that was going to take place, <laughs> He could have stopped it, and then that would have thrown a wrench in the whole system. But nobody knew that was coming. So, <laughs> but since the siege of Terra is over, what what's Dorn? What what did Dorn get up to, anyways? After the siege of Terra, well, in the aftermath of the tragic conflict known as the Horus Heresy, Roberte Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, just in case by now you didn't know who that was, penned the Codex Astartes. With its creation, the Primarch demanded that his brothers accept his example by defining their own legions into 1,000 member Space Marine chapters. Initially, Rogal Dorn opposed such a notion. He felt strongly that it was even more crucial for his Space Marines to remain consolidated so that they could continue to work closely together and protect the Imperium from the remnants of the traitor legions. With rising tension between the brothers on the subject, Rogel Dorn realized at this rate another civil war would break out. Rather than risk the fragile peace the Imperium had at this time, he relented and agreed to the second founding. <clears throat> um, excuse me. I, I did have to interrupt here anyways, because there's something else that's going on during this time that doesn't get talked about very often. Because it's a very small kind of concept in, in history. But the great scouring is taking place at this time, too. Okay. You know, which the you've is. done a fox on, which I yeah I have done it, but to which make to, was called what the great scouring. Okay, <laughs> but the, the concept behind it is is that it literally they so all the the space the chaos space marines are retreating at this point back to the eye of terror. So all oh, the loyalists at this point are chasing them back, and they're trying to reconquer all the planets that these these traitor marines had conquered so that's what the great scouring is is them kind of trying to clean up the mess and trying to get regain all the planets they never do actually accomplish it by the way yeah they end up shoving 
pretty much all of them back to the eye of terror. Uh, yeah, except for, except for I know Alpha Legion they did it. Not well, all of Alpha. Part Legion. of Alpha, Alpha Legion, Legion like splintered. Yeah, yeah. But and then, the other part went towards, ironically enough, towards um the ultimate uh, segmentum. Yeah. And then I want to say the Iron Warriors technically, they kind of just, I mean. Well, you, you'll talk about it here in a minute. But, I mean, they do end up back in the eye of terror, but it wasn't, you know, one of those, oh, run away. They they, no. they kind of chose to go back into the eye of terror. But also before we, we keep going anyways, Dorn was one of three people anyways that had a problem with the Codex of Stardust. Uh, the other two anyways, we've actually done boxes on. Uh, the Salamanders, which... <laughs> Vulcan had a very logical reason for it. It wasn't that he didn't like the Codex of Stardust. It was like he didn't. We don't have, have people. <laughs> we can't split this in like. Back. Sure, I'll split my group in half. Oh, that means there's only going to be four people in each chapter. That'll work. <laughs> yeah. The only people that are left is Bob, Steve, and Frank. <laughs> so I don't want to send Frank off by main chapter. Those just be Bob and Steve. <laughs> Oh, it will be freaking. Which, which, by the way, anyways, Gilman. I mean, as soon as Vulcan explained this, Gilman was just kind of like, "Yeah, okay, that makes sense." So, eventually, once you get back to chapter sp- strength, though, you need to start, sp- you know, making more foundings. Okay, we can do that. And then um, I know Corvus Corax wasn't a big fan of it, but he went with it. But yeah. <laughs> Liam and Russ. I, okay, I'm gonna have to. So why don't you keep going? I gotta look this back up again. How he got away with not following the Codex of Stardust? I don't know how he did I think it. It's it because just, of the fact it was that weird. They only, they only <laughs> recruit from one planet. Period. Yeah, I I don't know, man. Why, why don't, like but, I said, go ahead, go ahead, and uh, um, and keep going, anyways, about these second foundings, and uh, okay. uh, I'll look it up. So. Some controversy exists about the events occurring after he agreed to the Codex of Stars in Rogel Dorn's life. What is clear is that the Imperial Fist cannot be as easily divided into chapters as, for example, the Ultramarines could. The total commitment to the Legion was bred into each Marine, and many didn't wish to form their own chapters. Dorn found the answer to this problem in the meditation through self-inflicted pain using a device known as the pain glove. While under the influence of the device, Dorn had a vision of the emperor. The pain-induced vision revealed that his legion had to be redeemed, and that the way to do and that the way to salvation was through pain and self-sacrifice. Oh, oh no. You're talking about the iron cage, aren't you? Indeed. Now, if you want to know more about the iron cage, check out my brother's Vox. Royal Dorn's defeat at the Iron Cage. But I feel I should at least give a bare bones summary of the Battle of the Iron Cage. The collective pain needed to cleanse the chapter was decided by Dorn to be an Iron Warrior's fortress, the Iron Cage. Perturabo had built the massive fortifications to mock the Imperial Fists, and Dorn led his most diehard followers in a siege that would last for several weeks. Followers of the Iron Warriors claim that the Imperial Fist suffered a crushing defeat. Which they did. And that Dorn and his legion would have been wiped out if Perturabo hadn't prolonged Dorn's suffering so long that the Ocean Marines managed to intervene. On the flip side, loyalists say that it was obvious that the Iron Warriors wouldn't be able to finish off the Imperial Fist. Right. Whether this opinion is true remains to be seen, and Gilliman, not willing to risk the loss of Dorn, decided to intervene, extracting the battered Imperial Fists and letting the Iron Warriors escape. <laughs> the Imperial Fists created two new chapters. The Marines most devoted to the Primarch were to remain with the Imperial Fists. The most zealous, led by Sigismund, started the never-ending crusade of the Black Templars. The most recently initiated and level-headed members, with the exception of its veteran officers, formed the Crimson Fists. The first chapter master of the Crimson Fists was Alexis Pollux, which we will talk about later. 
No, we won't. We already the chapter's about name derives from the ceremony conducted at the initiation of new chapter masters in the Imperial Fifth Legion. The chapter master and the Primarch would both cut their palm and share blood in a warrior handshake, strengthening the Marine with the blood of the Primarch and forming a symbolic bond between them. No, okay, so real quick, actually, I, I looked into why Lehman Russ, what happened with Lehman Russ, why he didn't actually go along with the with the whole Codex of Stardays, and it really just boils down to he didn't want to. Gilliman kind of was like, well, you have to. Everybody has to. And Russ is like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> and apparently that was okay with Rabute Gilliman. He did not want to uh, <laughs> climb that hill, so to speak. And then at some point, they did have one second founding. They did try, yeah. They tried a second founding. And then, well, okay, so a couple probably things because Probably because the High Lords of Terry kept bugging them. But I was like, oh, fine. Well, either that or they were trying to expand. I don't know. But when they did try doing it anyways, the problem was the Canis Helix ended up corrupting the Wolf Brothers. That was the second founding's name. The other problem, though, was is that they were actually getting to a point where they could actually start doing more foundings. And then Magnus the Red showed up and destroyed the whole lab that they were working on it and everybody that was involved with it. So it was kind of lost to time. Right. And that was the other thing that took place. That was during the first siege of Fenris. But <clears throat> getting back to Dorn. Now, after the Iron Age debacle, Rogel Dorn continued his fight against Chaos and has gone missing and is presumed dead after attacking a Chaos fleet with a vastly outnumbered force. Seeing the importance of attacking an enemy fleet while they were still preparing, he relied on hit and run attacks until his reinforcements could arrive. Dorn went missing on board the Despoiler-class battleship Sword of Sacrilege after leading a desperate attack on its bridge. Only his hand was recovered, which is kept in stasis by his chapter on the phalanx, as, as Yuxin had mentioned. Dorn's skeletal fist is kept within the shrine, the bones intricately engraved with the heraldry of all the chapter's previous masters. Only okay. the chapter master. I just have to say... It's been perfectly preserved, and yet it's skeletal at this point. Eh, well, maybe maybe they actually, just to keep it preserved, like the hand thing anyways, maybe they actually melted off all the flesh. <laughs> the bone lasts a lot longer than anything else. I don't know. It seems like a really cheap imitation of, what, like, for instance, what they do with Bute Gilliman. They pretty much put him in stasis, and he didn't change at all for 10,000 years. And perfect pre preservation includes engraving the bones yeah. with heraldry. Yeah. Sorry. But only the chapter masters have the right to engrave his name upon the bones. Each bone corresponds to former commanders. Now, okay, so like you were just mentioning anyways, here's the, here's the other problem I have with it. So it's been 9,000 years since Nine, Dorn went missing, something like that, 9, 10. How many chapter masters do you think the Imperial Fist has had? And more importantly, anyways, how could they fit all of their names on a little tiny hand? <laughs> they ask help from the Jokero. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I wonder if it was like started out anyways, and it was like the first guy, anyways, he actually like put his name in there. It was all like big, and then all of a sudden, you know, after a few thousand years went by, they're like, oh crap, we're running out of room. So each well, chapter master has to write their name a little bit smaller. Hand. <laughs> What's the hat? How many bones are in the human hand? I, I don't know. I actually don't know. But I'm just That's saying anyways, is there's like each one after that. It's like, oh, crap. And they just keep writing their names smaller and smaller and smaller. It's kind of like anyways, when you're like writing across a page and you realize that you wanted one line, but you're running out of paper. So you're right. <laughs> So your words keep getting, or your, your writing of the words gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the very yeah. end. It's like point <laughs> two font. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, yet despite being considered dead by the Imperium at large, Doran's status remains unclear. During the War of the Beast, the rediscovered Primarch Vulcan, who everyone assumed was dead as well, mm -hmm, stated to Corland that he would speak well of the Imperial Fist to Rogel Dorn. Conrad Kurz, however, 
remain convinced of Dorne's death and that he was torn to pieces by the enemy. This fate was foreseen by the Night Haunter when the two brothers met on Nostromo and was confirmed many years later when Kurz reflected on his past while waiting to be executed by Mishen. But crucially, this answered only the how and was entirely lacking the win. Well, before we go, brother, do you think he's still alive? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hanging out with the Khan and Lumen Russ and Vulcan in the warp. Vulcan. <laughs> well, he's probably hanging out with Vulcan because Vulcan actually knows where he is. Oh, good point. Good point. <laughs> okay, so how many of them? Okay, how many of them? They've all pretty much disappeared, right? Other than, okay, other than Ferris Manus. Although Fabius Bile keeps making a clone of him so that Fulgrim can try to get him to join Chaos's side. And he refuses every time, so he cuts his head off again every single time. And then there's also another clone, anyways, of Ferris Manus that is in the uh, uh, Museum of Sol uh, Solomus. Trezine has a clone of Ferris Manus. Right. <laughs> but other than that... <laughs> And the two that are still that are actually walking around, Rabute Gilliam and the wine, because the Sanguinius is dead, right? They can't bring him back. He's he's dead, dead. <laughs> yeah, the rest of them, anyways, just kind of disappeared, right? Yeah. So out of the loyalists, there's only like what two that died. I mean, I so. that died and stayed dead. Right. <laughs> well, okay, technically three if you want to count Dorn. Everybody assumes yes, that he's dead. dead. <laughs> yeah. I honestly think that they'll probably bring back Dorn, but I, th I think he will come back from the warp. But quite frankly, anyways, the, the one anyway... You ever have this feeling at some point somebody's going to find out that they're all like in a pocket <laughs> world somewhere and they're like playing cards or something? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> they're all just hanging out, playing poker. Drinking beer because they're stuck there for who knows how long. It's like, well, it's more along we have the these cards, <laughs> or it's more along the lines of like, who's in charge, Gilliman? I don't want to go back. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so before we, oh well, well, the line is up there too. Well, then I really, then don't I really don't want to go back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so who do you think that the uh, who do you think will come back next before we take off here? I'm really hoping it's not Lehman Russ because well, he's he, it's mentioned anyways that when he comes back anyways it's going to be the time of the wolf which means everybody dies pretty much that's yeah. end time that's the end time <laughs> I don't think it's going to be Lehman Russ it'd be funny if it was um Alpharius or Magon was actually going to show up you know even though he supposedly has been showing up here and there. I mean, like, actually... actually he's a traitor, though. I said one of the ones that disappeared that's not a traitor. <laughs> well, as you know... He's still considered technically a traitor, so he's not part of the conversation. <laughs> I think it'd be funny if, if Ferris Manus came back, actually. <laughs> His clone, like, escapes from Solomus. <laughs> How did I get here? What's going on? <laughs> and just, or, not only that, but just how he could have just been released by Trezine for that matter. Uh, yeah, but you know, honestly, not only that, but think anyways, because out of all the ones, anyways, out of all the legions, or and or of all the chapters and what or the foundings, the Iron Warriors, in my opinion, drastically changed the most, or the uh, Iron Fists, Iron Hands, jeez, Iron Hands changed the most because i mean the they all they all thought anyways the biggest reason why they failed was because ferris manis was such a hot tempered individual right. so we will just remove ourselves from that completely and we will just be completely logical and then he shows back up again and he wants his he wants his chapter back i wonder how that would work out <laughs> well sir you need to be more logical what? <laughs> Anybody else want me to be more logical? No, I think we're good. I think we're good. <laughs> I think that would be probably the most entertaining. Um, the con would always be cool to come back. I love the con. Yeah. I'm not, a, you know, the funny thing is I'm not a big White Scars fan, but the con himself is awesome. Yeah. So 
Um, well, I think one of the reasons behind that is because there's like next to no real lore behind the White Scars. Island. Yeah, we when we did the White Scars, it was kind of it was rather difficult it, to find stuff on them. Yeah. Oh, they use vehicles. Oh, wait, they also use vehicles. Yeah. Uh, Dorn would be interesting to come back too. I know a lot of people don't want him to come back. I don't know why, but. I figured it'd be um, kind of interesting, but so before we take off, you have any last thoughts, anyways, on Rogel Dorn? What's your what's your overall perspective of the man? Um, I think he had too much pride, and it really hurt him later. Okay, <laughs> because yeah. you can see as soon as he lost at Terra, he really started to lose it in comparison to. I mean, not like lose it, like lose your mind, but significantly lost his um, his stoutness, so to speak. What makes you think that? I'm I'm not sure if I'm saying that quite correctly. His um, his drive, his drive. Yes. What makes you say that? Uh, because then he starts resorting to uh, let's just say unique methods of trying to figure out what to do next. Well, like uh, <clears throat> inflicting pain upon himself to try to get visions. Yeah, that I always thought that was kind of weird. Going off of the, a the tarot of pain. card. <laughs> well, the glove of pain, anyways. That thing was always kind of weird. But the iron cage, quite frankly, I think that was that was his emotions kind of got the better of him because I mean the guy he was going up against was Perabo, the guy that he really hates. So I think his emotions kind of got the better of him in that. But well, at this time he really hated it. Before he was <laughs> so indifferent towards. Uh okay, yeah. It, but in the Great Crusade, during okay, by the end of the Great Crusade, they both hated each other. It was very much, anyways, they would they couldn't even be in the same room together. But yes, the very beginning, sure, they were much more indifferent with each other. But at this, by this point, anyways, the, the feeling is mutual between the two. Oh. Put it that way. And, and to let people case. know, we do know that there were other second foundings of the Imperial Fist. There is the Exorciators like, or something like that, the Fist Exemplar, and maybe the Soul Drinkers. The Soul Drinkers are were originally stated as yes, and they did. They were given a weapon by Dorn, but now for some reason it's up to contest. And then there's another one that is suspected, which is called the Silver Guard, I want to say. But originally, anyways, it was just those two. The, the Black ones, Templars yeah. and the Crimson Fist, yeah. But yeah, I I don't know if he necessarily lost his drive. I think anyways that for a while there he kind of floundered because he'd never lost before. So it's like, what is this losing? I don't understand it. And then when he loses the second time, anyways, at the Iron Cage, I think, anyways, he, like I said, I think his drive was still there. I mean, he he ends up making these new foundings. It, it takes him twenty years, anyways, and he reestablishes the Imperial Fist into this yet again a great company. And then he continues on, anyways, fighting against chaos. So I I don't know necessarily if his his drive just disappeared. I think there was a time anyways, where he really was floundering with, with just trying to figure out anyways, how to lose, which <laughs> is something he never had to learn because he never lost. But right. then he, I think he figures it out. And I think quite frankly, anyways, like I said before, I think he would have been far more interesting if he'd stuck around a little bit longer. I think he would have gained quite a bit more. We would have found him a little bit more humble. And with a little bit more understanding anyways, and which would quite frankly make him even a better leader. But we will never know because he disappeared. And on that note, we were out of time. We were way out of time. <laughs> but join us next time as we discuss some of the more notable actions of the Imperial Fist, as well as who they were before the arrival of Rogel Dorn. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this box. Feel free to like, follow, subscribe, and comment. And don't forget to check out the shop. We got some cool stuff there, like clothes, pillows, and hats. 
And if you really enjoyed the program, feel free to join our membership program on our YouTube channel, Tales of Asheraka. Quite right, brother. And also, don't forget to put your questions in the comments so we have a boatload of them for a Q&A at the end of the month. <laughs> like Hermes has been doing for the last few weeks. <laughs> Except for try more towards the beginning, not <laughs> at the last second. Oh no, he doesn't have he doesn't have to send any more questions. He's sent them out. I mean he probably will, but he's sent about twenty of them <laughs> that we haven't ah. answered yet. But for the rest of you, including Hermes, have a great day. And as always, <clears throat> until next time, this is Ekthar. And Yuxin. Signing off. <laughs>